I want to tell you how honored I am to receive this award today, not only because of my respect for all the prior recipients, Dr. Nusslein Volhard among them on the front row, and many others in the audience. We had a wonderful dinner the other night with 10 former Conklin Medal recipients and had a truly wonderful time. And so I'm especially honored to have, have my name added to the list of these former recipients who I deeply admire and consider uh, as my close friends. So what I thought I would do is, uh, this was at Ida's suggestion, I'll give you a, a, a brief overview of the, of the arc of uh, my career and the work of my laboratory and also tell you about some interesting sidelines that happened uh, along the way, some of which are scientific, some of which are not scientific. So my lab has, has worked for 35 years to try to decipher the fundamental mechanisms of muscle biology, muscle development, and muscle disease. And to put this into context, muscle provides the meaning to life. Every, that's how I start out all my grants too. <laughs> Every activity of every animal on this planet is due to muscle. My friends who are neuroscientists don't like to hear me say it, but muscle is the sole readout for the nervous system. And of, from the wonders of nature, such as the beating of the hummingbird wing 1,000 times per minute, to the movement of the largest animals that ever roamed the earth, to the beating of the heart once per second that defines the boundaries of embryonic and adult life. It's all dependent on the second-to-second -second function of muscle. To all the wonders of art, of music, I'll have more to say about this individual later, and to athleticism, it's all about uh, muscle, how it forms, how it functions. So as I said, over the past 35 years, our group has sought to discover the key regulatory mechanisms, the key transcription factors and developmental controls that orchestrate the formation of each of the three major muscle cell types, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And along the way, we have been successful in identifying some key molecular landmarks in these pathways to understand how they drive the processes of muscle differentiation and morphogenesis. And perhaps not unexpectedly, but importantly, we recognized early on that many of the developmental mechanisms that we were uncovering had relevance to the many diseases that afflict all of these different muscle cell types. And so in the second half of this talk, I'll describe to you some of our efforts to try to leverage the knowledge of developmental biology that we had obtained to try to develop new therapeutic approaches for treating various muscle disorders. So in the beginning, when I started my lab in the early 1980s, uh, many of the young people here will be, might be surprised to realize there had not been a single transcription factor uh, cloned at that time. There was no genome sequence available. And just to, to obtain 200 base pairs of DNA required a massive effort in long sequencing gels. And muscle, to me, appeared to be one of the most amenable systems to try to decipher some of the fundamental mechanisms of developmental biology. How do genes get switched on to orchestrate a cell fate? How do they coordinately control the morphogenesis of the tissue and then lead to the function of the adult tissue? And this was the pathway as it was thought to occur at, at that time with no molecular landmarks whatsoever in this pathway. Then in 1984, there was a seminal discovery by uh, Harold Weintraub, shown here, a brilliant uh, intellect and a friend of mine. And he discovered MyOD, which really captured the imagination of the field because he showed that MyOD, when introduced into a non-muscle cell like a fibroblast, could convert that cell into a muscle cell. And this was the first real master gene to be demonstrated, and it presaged the ultimate discovery of the pluripotency, so-called Yamanaka factors, which could also uh, modulate cell fate, a discovery that came decades uh, later. But at that time, I was a struggling assistant professor, and my lab was studying a muscle cell line, 
and basing all our studies on trying to understand how muscle cells differentiate. And when the, the master gene of myogenesis was discovered, MyoD, we, like everyone else, went to look at whether or how it was expressed in the cells we were working on, and MyoD was not expressed in our cells. <laughs> so we thought, oh my goodness, maybe we're not even working on muscle cells. What, what could this... What could this be? And I couldn't get a grant funded at that time either. It was kind of reinforced the opinion on the study section that I maybe didn't know what I was doing. So we took MyoD and we used a low stringency hybridization technique to try to ask whether we could find any sequences. Of course, there's no genome sequence, so you couldn't just go blast the sequence. We did low stringency hybridization and looked for something related to MyoD and we discovered a sequence related to it. And we called it myogenin, and uh, my friend Woody Wright uh, discovered myogenin at the same time. And we introduced then myogenin into fibroblasts, and this is what we found. It could convert them into multinucleated muscle fibers very ro robustly. This was uh, really a great, uh, great moment, I can tell you. And then uh, Rudy Yanish made a knockout mouse of myoD. And the knockout mouse of MyoD had normal muscle, and they were viable, and that raised more questions. Wow, what's going on? So we learned the method to how to make knockout mice uh, in my lab, and we made a knockout mouse of myogenin. Sometimes you get really lucky. So when we made the myogenin knockout mice, this is what they looked like. They were born alive because their hearts were beating, but they were perfectly motionless. And the reason they were motionless was they had no muscle at, at all. Here's normal muscle multinucleated fibers, and here's the MyoD knockout mice. They were bags of myoblasts. And this was the first demonstration that myogenin was the critical switch for the activation of the entire program for myogenesis. Now, at the same time, there had not been any, any tissue-specific enhancers discovered at that time, much less anything in, in the muscle field, and a lot of people were working on muscle enhancers. And so we decided to pick a representative muscle gene, the muscle creatine kinase gene, MCK, and this shows why we picked it. It switches on hundreds of fold at the onset of myogenesis, and we thought maybe we could find some DNA sequence that controls this uh, gene. And after a lot of work, we ultimately identified a short sequence which we used in a DNA binding assay, a so-called gel shift assay, and we showed it could bind to a molecular complex, a protein that was specific for myotubes, differentiated muscle cells, but not myoblasts, and we named this protein MEF2. Now, at that time, as I said, there was no genome sequence. We identified the binding site for MEF2, and it's shown here. It's an AT-rich sequence. And we noted at that time that there were some fragments of genomic sequence that were close by to other muscle genes, although they had not been functionally interrogated. And we aligned all these, and we came up with a crude consensus sequence, and we postulated that maybe this protein might bind to a sequence upstream of all muscle genes and turn them on. And subsequently, when MEF2 was cloned and the sequence was characterized remarkably, that sequence turned out to be the precise consensus for the binding of this transcription factor. So when MEF2 was cloned then, we went on and looked at its expression, and this shows its expression in a laxy transgenic mouse. The myogenic gene is expressed at the onset of myogenesis in the cell mites, which are forming along the body axis in every cell in which muscle is forming. There were multiple MEF2 genes, and we couldn't generate knockout mice efficiently for all of them, so we went to Drosophila, and there's a single ancestral MEF2 gene in flies, which we call DMEF2, and we knocked it out after doing an EMS mutagenesis screen, and this shows myosin in a wild-type memory, and this shows in the MEF2 mutant. And the, the elimination of this gene extinguished all myogenesis in every muscle lineage, not only skeletal muscle, but also heart and in visceral muscle. So this was the first demonstration of a transcription factor that could control myogenesis across the different muscle cell types. And as Alejandro said, uh, postdocs in our lab, particularly uh, Jeff Mulcatine, uh, Brian Black, and Jim Martin, went on to biochemically elucidate the mechanism of action of MEF2, show that it functions as a cofactor together with MyoD, and these two proteins then serve it as the, the switch to turn on all uh, muscle genes. Now, at the same time, the process of myoblast fusion, how do you take a single mononucleated cell and turn it into a fiber that has thousands of nuclei in a common cytoplasm? This was a big mystery and one that fascinated uh, us. And 
In recent years, we described the discovery of two proteins that work together in a macromolecular complex to drive fusion, one of which is a novel seven-pass transmembrane protein we call Myomaker, and the second is a tiny micropeptide which has, spans the membrane once. These two proteins interact, and together they are sufficient and they're necessary to drive myoblast fusion. And they're not only sufficient in muscle, they can drive the fusion of virtually any cells, and this shows an example here. We've labeled GFP fibroblasts and put myomaker and myomixer into them. And they get absolutely consumed by muscle fibers because they're, they're so fusogenic with these two molecules. And we're currently using these two molecules as way to, or ways to orchestrate uh, heterotypic fusion between various cells. So this is the uh, molecular pathway, at least the, the, the basic details that we elucidated uh, for how muscle forms, and that is the myogenin gene is the essential switch for activating all downstream events of myogenesis. It's turned on by two upstream genes, MyoD and MIF5, which act redundantly. Myogenin and MEF2 regulate each other in a feed-forward circuit, and that stabilizes the muscle phenotype and, and, and uh, drives it towards differentiation. Then they activate myomaker and myomixer, which together orchestrate myotube formation and myofiber. Uh, development. Now, at the same time as we were gaining traction in studying um, skeletal myogenesis, we turned our attention to arguably the most complex and interesting of all muscle types, and that's the cardiac muscle of the heart. The heart is formed, uh, as uh, we and others showed, Mark Fishman, who was here earlier, also showed this in zebrafish, that the heart is formed in a modular way in which the different chambers of the atria and the right and left ventricle and the valves, etc., are each controlled by a separable uh, transcriptional uh, pathway. And uh, students in, and postdocs in our lab discovered many of the key regulatory factors. And these are some of the ones that they discovered and genetically interrogated and ascribed to the, these various steps in the pathway. And so these genes are now landmarks in the pathway for heart formation, and many groups uh, around the world have filled in a lot of details, beautiful details, on these pathways as to how this uh, molecular roadmap is set in motion to control the formation of the heart. Now, the third mysterious muscle cell type are, are smooth muscle cells that line the vessels, all the blood vessels in the body, and line the internal organs. And early on, it was known that all smooth muscle, muscle genes were controlled by this sequence. It's an AT-rich sequence related to the MEF2 binding site, actually, and this is known as a card box. And Richard Treisman had shown that the card box is a binding site for a ubiquitously expressed transcription factor called SRF. But this was a mystery. How does a ubiquitous transcription factor bind this site and confer this highly specialized pattern of vascular uh, transcription? And so we sought to address that question, and Daji Wang from our lab discovered a, a novel coactivator, which we named myocardin, which we showed physically interacted with SRF. And this is the expression pattern of myocardin in pseudocolored red in an embry mouse embryo. And you can see in red, it marks all the vessels, it marks the vascular, the visceral smooth muscle cells of the gut, and it marks uh, the heart. And this just shows you the. the the remarkable potency of this uh, coactivator. You know, this is a reporter assay where you can take a card box driving uh, luciferase, and in the absence of myocardin, this is the basal level of activation with SRF. You had myocardin, and it really activates this uh, promoter. And if you make a mutation in the card box, all the activity of myocardin is lost. So this is a non-DNA binding coactivator that orchestrates uh, the events of vascular and cardiac development. And subsequently, we and others uh, discovered that this was the founding member of a family of transcription factors called myocardin-related transcription factors, MRTFs A, B, and another one. And you can see there the functions of each of these, which we initially defined in uh, controlling the various aspects of muscle development. But subsequently, we and others have shown that these genes, and particularly these two, which are not muscle-specific, connect signals from the cytos, from the actin cytoskeleton to the nucleus, and they regulate a plethora 
of events ranging from neurite outgrowth to endothelial development, et cetera. Uh, we're continuing to work on that. Now, having established a foundation for understanding at least some of the key regulatory events in development of the heart, we turned our attention to disorders of the heart. And all of you, I think, realize that heart disease is the number one cause of death uh, in uh, the industrialized world. And the reason that that is, is because when the adult heart sustains injury, either genetic or, um, or acquired, it undergoes a response in which cardiac muscle cells here in the transverse section of the left ventricle are lost and they're replaced by a fibrotic scar. And this leads to the loss of, of pump function. In contrast, as we've shown and others have subsequently shown, the neonatal mouse heart can fully regenerate in response to injury. So we've tried to, to understand, could we intervene in this process and either block the injury response or revert it and through various molecular means. And to do that, we have uh, focused in four areas. One is to try to ask, are there signal transduction pathways that modulate this uh, response? We've discovered microRNAs and micropeptides that play key regulatory roles here. We've studied reprogramming and genomic editing. One way that I approach science is to try to look beyond what is to what could be. And we knew what was. We knew all, a lot of the regulatory mechanisms of developmental biology, but we did not know if they could be harnessed to develop any new therapeutics. And I, was, I became keenly interested in trying to see how far we could push the envelope uh, of this work. And so each of these different pathways I've shown here led to the founding of biotechnology companies. The Myogen was the first one that I co-founded, followed by Myogen, Tanaya, and most recently Exonix. And I'll talk to you just briefly in the remainder of the talk about some of our efforts to try to, to leverage the knowledge of developmental biology and gene regulation to develop new therapeutics. So heart failure, is, as I mentioned, is the number one uh, cause of death in mankind, and it's accompanied by uh, dilation and loss of, of pump function. And uh, Tim McKinsey and, and Jeff Mulkentine in our lab uh, elucidated a transcriptional cascade of signals that are, evoke, that are evoked by cardiac stress and culminate in the nucleus. And lo and behold, they culminated on many of the same developmental regulators that we had already studied, as had others. And this led to the, the demonstration of a signal transduction pathway that modulated the heart, uh, the heart response to stress through a nuclear shuttling of a histone deacetylase. And at that time, I didn't, I really uh, knew nothing about a business, biotech, uh, or therapeutic development, but it just seemed that it was incumbent upon us to push this work as far as we could push it and see, see what would happen. So I was able to co-found a biotech company. It was called Myogen Therapeutics. It developed from an idea, and the two scientists, uh, Tim McKinsey and uh, Dylan Fan from our lab, went there to pioneer this company at the scientific level. It grew to, you can see here, a large company was traded publicly on the NASDAQ as a very successful company and was ultimately acquired by uh, Gilead Therapeutics. Now, at the same time, we began to realize that microRNAs also played a key role in development of all the muscles in the body, uh, and including uh, in the heart. And uh, Ava Van Roy and others from our group found that several microRNAs could be ascribed to various pathological functions uh, in the heart, such as cell survival, fibrosis, angiogenesis, etc. And through genetic studies in mice, we were able to validate that the manipulation of these microRNAs could uh, block or reverse aspects of pathological remodeling. And so this suggested, yet again, a way in which we might be able to modulate heart disease through, through microRNA-dependent pathways. And so we formed a company which we called Mirogen. And uh, Ava Van Roy, who, uh, I think I saw her in the audience somewhere, um, she went there as the pioneering scientist to set up all this work. And this company now has six clinical trials ongoing for uh, manipulation of microRNAs for, for heart disease. Now lastly, in the last aspect of our efforts to develop therapeutics, I, I want to talk about genetic diseases of muscle. And 
For the students in the audience, this is an area of enormous unmet medical need. There are more than 800 monogenic disorders in, in muscle alone that are caused by mutations in hundreds of genes. These are genes encoding proteins ranging from transcription factors to components of the mitochondria to cytoskeletal proteins and structural proteins. And there's not a single cure for any of these uh, disorders. The holy grail of muscle disease, the biggest one of all, is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, DMD. This is a disease that affects one in 5,000 boys, 300,000 boys in the world right now struggle with this disease. It's the most common fatal genetic disorder diagnosed in childhood. And as I said, there's no cure. Everything has been thrown at this disease, but everything that's been thrown at this disease has addressed the symptoms of the disease, not the cause of the disease. And I'll come back to that. This is how the disease is diagnosed. The di disease is first recognized almost always by the mother who notices that their son is struggling on the playground or having difficulty getting up the stairs, usually by the age of two. And the child will be diagnosed, if the child's diagnosed with Duchenne, no person has ever escaped the consequences of a genetic diagnosis of Duchenne. It leads to loss of ambulation during the most sensitive time in young boys' lives. They become confined to wheelchairs, uh, constricted to ventilators because the diaphragm disintegrates and then they uh, die from heart failure during the mid-20s. The disease is caused by the absence of a protein called dystrophin, schematized here. It was discovered more than 30 years ago, cloned more than 30 years ago by Luke Kunkel here in Boston. And what dystrophin does is it interconnects the cytoskeleton with, the, with a cell adhesion complex at the membrane. And this is what it looks like in an immunostain through cross-sections of muscle fibers. And it's essential as a scaffold or a shock absorber for all the muscles in the body, which you can imagine with the constant wear and tear and contractility of the heart and the skeletal muscles, particularly as boys are growing and moving, without this protein to stabilize muscle membranes, they ultimately disintegrate. Now the protein, as I mentioned, is analogous to a shock absorber. The two ends of the protein are essential for function because they anchor it to the cytoskeleton and, and the cell adhesion complex, but the central region is comprised of a series of rod domains, and you can think about them as redundant coils in a spring that maintain the, the muscle uh, integrity. This is the intron-exon organization of the gene. It contains 79 exons across vertebrate species, and the splicing patterns are conserved across species, so you can see that the reading frame is maintained when the shapes of two uh, adjacent exons fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Now, one of the challenges of this disorder is that there's more than 7,000 mutations that have been identified in boys around the world with Duchenne. And so it raises a challenge. How could you even conceive of a genetic means of correcting a disease that has so many different mutations? But these mutations cluster into what are known as hot spots, and there's 10 exons shown here in red that account for about 80% of the mutations uh, in, in boys. And so we wondered, if we could devise a genetic strategy to bypass mutations in some of these exons, could we piece the protein back together through genetic modification? And this is the, the basis for the concept of exon skipping that many of you may have heard of. So we turned our attention to CRISPR-Cas9 and asked, could we really go right at the cause of this disease? We know the cause. The cause is single errors in the DNA code for this protein. And we knew we could not use homologous recombination to address this because homologous recombination only works in proliferating cells and all muscles in your body are post-mitotic. So we knew we had to use homologous, uh, uh, non-homologous end joining or NHEJ. And so we came up with a simple scheme which we call single cut CRISPR where we could direct a, a Cas9 or any gene editing enzyme with a single guide to an exon that's out of frame. So for example, the most common deletion in boys with Duchenne is the deletion of exon 50. And you can see why the deletion of exon 50 causes Duchenne, because exon 49 splices to the next exon in line, and that's 51, and the shapes don't match. So it puts 51 out of frame, and it can't make the C-terminus of the protein. It's unstable, and they end up in a wheelchair. So we looked at that, and we said there's two ways we might be able to do this. We could use a PAM sequence at the splice junction, and fortuitously, AG, the same 
PAM sequence for cutting by Cas9. It's the universal splice acceptor sequence of all exons. So that was really fortuitous. So if you made an indel there, you could just induce exon skipping, or you could perhaps induce a slight mutation in exon 51 and reframe it if you could put the triplet codons back in frame with the preceding exon. So we set up a Duchenne muscular dystrophy clinic uh, in, in Dallas, and this is how it works. Patients come in, usually we a, a patient with his normal brother. We take a small sample, blood sample from these patients and we convert them into cardiomyocytes in a dish through uh, IP, an IPS uh, step, which you're all familiar with. And then we can test a series of guide RNAs or gene editing enzymes in these cardiomyocytes in a dish and ask, can we edit this gene to remove the mutation and restore the production of the missing dystrophin protein? And if we can do that, can we restore contractility, muscle integrity, and other properties of muscle that are missing uh, in uh, these boys with Duchenne? This is the source of uh, much of our inspiration, certainly my inspiration. This is Ben. He lives in my neighborhood, and he went to school with my kids. That's his mother and his physician, Pradeep Mammy. You can see Ben is in a wheelchair. Ben is, has become the most uh, vocal spokesperson for the Duchenne uh, community, and you could call him our, he was our patient zero for testing our technology in IPS-derived cardiomyocytes from his body. So we, he donated to us a small blood sample, and we made cardiomyocytes, and here they are, and they're stained with dystrophin in red, and there's no dystrophin as we knew there would not be. And then we tested our strategy for single cut correction by removing his mutation. And there's what we saw. So we could restore dystrophin production to normal levels in Ben's cells by this single cut approach. I can tell you, uh, certainly one of the most inspiring moments of my career was when Ben came up to the laboratory, looked through the microscope, saw his own cells making dystrophin protein that his body cannot make. Subsequent to that, we have received so many um, inquiries. I, I get emails every day from mothers of boys with Duchenne telling me what their son's mutation is, asking if it can be corrected. They always send me the picture. These are just some of, every one of these boys has Duchenne, and we know all their mutations. A lot of these mutations we've corrected. These two here are brothers, both of whom have Duchenne. And that really underscores another tragic aspect of this disease, and that is the disease is usually not diagnosed often until age three or four, and it's not uncommon that a family will have had a second son before the first one was diagnosed, and oftentimes that second son, 50% of the cases, that second son will also develop the disease. So I just want to say that our work in this area as we've tried to move it forward has been really embraced and inspired by the incredible support and positivity of these uh, families and these patients. So we went on then and wanted to test this technology in vivo, in an animal model of Duchenne. There was not one with the most common human mutation, so we generated one with CRISPR. We deleted exon 50, the most common mutation. Here's what happened. These, these are mice with the most common deletion. They don't have any dystrophin. And here you can see what dystrophin looks like in all these muscles. We engineered CRISPR-Cas into AAV9, which has tropism for muscle, and we used the creatine kinase enhancer, hearkening back to the very beginning when we had characterized that enhancer, we used that enhancer to restrict any uh, expression away from the liver, and we injected these animals after several rounds of optimization. This is what we saw. So these animals could be restored within one to two months of almost normal levels of dystrophin uh, throughout all the muscles in the body. And it's been estimated that if one could restore 15%, 1-5% of the normal level of dystrophin in a boy, that you could probably cure this disease. You don't have to get to 100%. The protein's made in vast excess, so really a modest level could be uh, curative. Then we wanted to take the next, which was a monumental step, I think, and asked, could this really be translated into a large animal? And we identified within the Royal Veterinary College in London a family of dogs that had exactly the same mutation as we had made in the mouse and was the same most common mutation in boys. And so we went uh, to London and we 
treated those dogs uh, with um, the virus. This was done by Leonela Amawasi, who's uh, now a scientist here at Exonix in, in Boston. I think I see her in the back of the room. So this just shows some Western blotting with the, the quantification of the level of dystrophin protein that could be restored by this approach. So these are three different muscles, heart, here's the, an the animal, the dog with the human mutation, the same as the human mutation, no dystrophin, and then when we treat, eight weeks after one dose, we could restore dystrophin. It's not perfect, but it's really good for a first pass, and we think probably it'll continue to increase uh, over time. So we've been greatly um, encouraged by uh, these results, and I'll show you here the uh, this is what the dogs look like. So the first shows a normal brother in this litter. These are really cute dogs, I'll tell you. So they're beagles, they run and jump and hop. And the next dog is his brother with Duchenne, same age, and you'll see he can't run. He will hop like a rabbit, and his muscles are emaciated, unfortunately. So this animal's in the early stages of Duchenne. He's quite hobbled by the disease, and then we treat and we looked eight weeks later in his brother, and this is what we saw. So, so this, these animals that were treated for eight weeks with CRISPR to restore dystrophin, or run, no dystrophin dog ever behaves like that. They run, they jump. It's a very happy puppy. I could watch these videos all day long. <laughs> Yes, that is a Duchenne dog after eight weeks of injection. So this is where we are uh, with this, this work uh, so far. We have uh, modeled the disease in uh, patient-derived cardiomyocytes from a variety, with a variety of mutations to optimize the, the best guides and the best strategies and to prove to ourselves that if we can restore dystrophin protein production, is it functional and is it stable and does it interact with all the right partner proteins and you can reconstitute that in cells from the actual human being that you might want to ultimately treat. So this is what you would call precision medicine or disease in a dish. We've made the mice that harbor uh, many mutations. Uh, now we've made a collection of mice that represent almost half of the uh, Duchenne uh, patients, you know, Yi Li Min, student in our lab who's now at Exonix led much of that work and we were translating it into dogs and are now doing additional uh, work. And this work became too, uh, too big to be uh, contained within an academic laboratory so we started a, a biotech company here in Boston called Exonix Therapeutics that's taken this forward and this was recently acquired by Vertex Pharmaceuticals and they're going to really uh, enable us, I think, to move this technology forward. So I am um, really honored to receive this, this uh, award. There's a, an old saying in, in Texas, where I'm from, says if you see a turtle sitting on the top of a fence post, you can be sure he had to get a lot of help getting up there. <laughs> you can be sure I had a lot of help getting up here. Here's that help. Uh, these are uh, credible people that they came together for a reunion that you heard about earlier. And uh, these are students and postdocs, former students and postdocs and trainees that are really successful uh, all over the world. This is my current uh, group. Uh, in Dallas, we've got a great group, of, really great group of, uh, of people there, really proud of them. And the work that's gone on over the generations uh, in my lab uh, could not have been done without uh, two people, Rhonda Basil Duby and Ning Liu, who helped me to run the lab. They really make everything work while I'm out traveling around talking, <laughs> talking about science or while I'm talking to people in the lab all day. They're the ones that make it all work and keep me out of trouble. So I want to thank them in particular. And then Ida. Ida told me I have to make this a fun talk at the end, tell you something you don't know about me. And she's a huge fan of rock and roll, in case you didn't know that. So I have a rock and roll band. It's called the Transactivators. 
all the non-scientists, they can't ever remember the name of my band. They're always saying to me, what's the name of your band again? The, the transvestites? <laughs> so she's a big fan, and she's come to several of our gigs, and she wanted me to, to entertain you with a brief clip of, of the band playing. So I'm going to try to do that here. Let's see if I can. Everybody having a good time out there? <laughs> You get the idea. <laughs> hey. hey, I like that. Never got that much applause before. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not quitting my day job. So, you know, you never know where science could lead you, and you've got to be open to just opportunities and Again, look beyond what is to what could be. And so I started this rock band because I'd always been interested in music. I grew up in a musical family and I had a musical hero. And some of you may know him, some of you may not. His name's Willie Nelson. He's the most iconic country music star in the world and is an icon of Texas. I'd always admired his music. And through the Transactivators, I got to know Willie and his wife Annie here. And they Willie always supports good causes. Many of you know he's raised money for the farm, American farmers and lots of things. He decided to raise money for me. So that was, I thought that was a really good cause. <laughs> so uh, he raised money and created a, a chair. It's called the Andy Willie Nelson Chair. And that's, uh, this is in, on their ranch. They're autographing a guitar that hangs outside my audience, uh, outside of my uh, office. It's kind of the touchstone, a good luck piece of our department. And, he travels around on a bus. Many of you may have heard about what happens on that bus. What happens on that bus stays on that bus. Uh, that's Willie and, and uh, myself and uh, one of my good friends who plays in the band, Jay Schneider, on Willie's bus. And he often invites me backstage or travel around with him on, to various things. It's quite a, from what I can remember about it, it's, it's quite an experience. So, you know, they're always up for a good time. And um, lastly, a few years ago, there was, I've had a lot of interesting experiences along the way with them, but uh, a few years ago, there was something called the uh, ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. And I, I gave Willie the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, and he accepted the challenge. So let's see, you may have to turn the volume up on this one. Hi, we're at Annie and Willie Nelson. The president of my university hates that last line. <laughs> anyway, that's all I've got to say today. I want to thank again uh, all of you. I, wa I want to thank the people who supported me for this award. I want to especially thank the people from my group over the years, the decades actually, that made it possible for me to be up here. Thank you very much.
Thank you, our awardees, for inspiring us, for illustrating so well how developmental biologists um, are advancing science through research, discovery, and education. Uh, thank you for illustrating so beautifully uh, the theme of this meeting, developmental biology, from deconstruction to reconstruction and construction. Uh, and thank you, Eric, for ushering us in a party mode. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you at 7 p.m. Uh, for the banquet. There will be awards, uh, there will be joy, and thank you so much for coming to this meeting and let's celebrate 80 years of this wonderful society. <laughs>